How Our Language Governs Our Behavior Good communication is good business. Research findings consistently indicate that free, two-way communication results in improved morale, greater productivity, and smoother relations between supervisor and subordinate. Communication is the basis for understanding, coordination, cooperation, and action. But recognizing the importance of communication is not the same as practicing good communication. Every day we encounter situations ranging from the humorous to the tragic in which something has gone wrong because of poor communication. Why look to language? A classic example is the plight of the motorist whose car stalled on a main thoroughway in a congested eastern city. The battery was dead and all attempts to start the car were in vain. Finally, in desperation, the motorist flagged down a lady driver who agreed to push his car to get it started. The stranded driver carefully explained to the woman that because the car was equipped with automatic transmission, you'll have to get up to 30 to 35 miles an hour to get me started. The lady nodded wisely and headed for her car. The man climbed into his car and waited for her push. He waited and waited. After a while, he turned around to see where the woman was. She was there all right, and he was just in time to see her coming at him at 30 to 35 miles per hour. Such misunderstandings are not the prerogative of women. The National Foreman's Institute reports the following example. A foreman told a machine operator he was passing, Better clean up around here. It was ten minutes later when the foreman's assistant phoned, Say, boss, isn't that bearing Cypert is working on do up an engineering pronto? You bet your sweet life it is why. He says you told him to drop it and sweep the place up. I thought I'd better make sure. Listen, the foreman flared into the phone. Get him right back on that job. It's got to be ready in 20 minutes. What the foreman had in mind was for Cypert to gather up the oily waste which was a fire and accident hazard, this would not have taken more than a couple of minutes, and there would have been plenty of time to finish the bearing. But Seipert wasn't geared to understand what the foreman was trying to say. Many such predicaments arise when our actions are based on false assumptions. The study of general semantics will help us understand what is involved in these communication problems. What is general semantics? Semantics is the study of the meanings of words and of the history of changes in word meanings. Out of this study has grown a new, broader field of interest which is known as general semantics. General semantics is the study of the relationship between language, thought, and human behavior. It is concerned with the ways in which our language and other symbols can lead us to make assumptions that influence our thinking and behavior. Whenever we speak, listen, think, observe, or make decisions, we are also making assumptions. While you are listening, you are making the assumption, consciously or unconsciously, that your chair will hold you. I am making the assumption that you are sitting. The noted general semanticist Alfred Korzybski has pointed out that wisdom begins when we become conscious of our assumptions. However, it is not always easy to recognize these, and we are often unaware of the effects of our unconscious assumptions upon our behavior. The Importance of Logical Fate the notion of unconscious assumptions and the concept of logical fate are important to our understanding of general semantics. Logical fate, so called by the mathematician philosopher Cassius Kaiser, is a process in which certain conclusions and behavior follow logically from unconscious assumptions. In other words, if you make certain assumptions, 
your conclusions and behavior will automatically follow a certain logical pattern. Consider the following story. Jim Jones was standing on the corner waiting for a bus. The corner was dark and lonely. Jim knew that many robbers were around that neighborhood because he was familiar with it. While he was waiting for a bus, a man sneaked up behind him and hit him on the back. Jim whirled around quickly and socked the man with a hard right squarely on the jaw. Was Jim right in hitting the man who sneaked up behind him? It all depends on whether Jim's assumption that the man was a robber was correct. In any case, he acted on the basis of this assumption. The process of logical fate also occurs when we communicate. We act in accordance with what we assume the other person meant. In this way, language factors greatly affect our behavior. This recording will present some of the findings of general semantics. It will point out the way in which our evaluation of the world around us influences our behavior. It will also indicate how the various meanings of a word can lead to confused communication. Finally, it will explore the dangers of certain communication or common language problems. How we react to words and things. We may think of ourselves as living in two distinct worlds. One is the world of words, the verbal world. The other is the world of things, the nonverbal world. Words may be used to stand for the nonverbal phenomena which surround us, but the words can never actually be the things they represent. Pinch yourself. What you feel is nonverbal. You can certainly use words to describe what you felt, but you must distinguish between the verbal description and the nonverbal sensation you actually experienced. We often fail to make this distinction. By confusing words with the things they represent, we arrive at conclusions which do not fit the facts. A lady in Florida entertained a group of people for dinner. Everyone was delighted with the meal, although no one could decide exactly what the main course was. After the dinner, a lady approached the hostess and said, I enjoyed that food so much, I would like to learn to prepare it. Would you please tell me what we had? The hostess turned to the lady and said, Yes, of course. You just had the pleasure of eating snake steaks. Upon hearing that, the lady had the unfortunate experience of seeing her food for the second time. What was it to which this lady actually responded? It couldn't have been the nonverbal phenomenon, the snake steak, because she had enjoyed eating it. Instead, she was responding to the word snake and all its associations. Another example of this confusion between the verbal and the nonverbal is the case of the science professor who put in a request for a washroom mirror in his department. His request was denied on the grounds that a mirror was classified as a non-scientific item. The undaunted professor then put in a new request. This time his mirror was provided promptly. The only change in his requisition was the use of a more technical terminology. He asked for one human reflector. To understand the reactions of these examples better, let's take a look at human behavior in its simplest form. The Behavior Sequence the story of Jim Jones standing on the street corner illustrates the sequence of steps involved in human behavior. In the first place, something happened. In this case, someone crept up behind Jim and hit him on the shoulder. Next, and almost simultaneously, Jim became aware of this happening through the action of his nervous system. 
he very quickly sized up what was going on, and this led to his response of turning about and socking the man in the jaw. These, then, are the four steps involved in human behavior. Number one, something happens in the nonverbal world. Number two, a nervous impact creates awareness of the happening. Number three, evaluation follows in which the happening is sized up. And number four, response occurs either in words or actions based upon the evaluation. The third step, evaluation, is the link, therefore, between nonverbal facts as they are and our behavior as it is related to these facts. Our evaluations must fit the facts of the situation if our responses are to be scientifically appropriate and intelligent. Suppose that the man behind Jim had been an old friend trying to surprise him. Jim's violent response would then have been more drastic than the situation demanded. Let's take a closer look at human responses. Three ways in which we respond. There are three different kinds of responses or reactions which govern our behavior. The first are called reflex responses. These are simple acts which usually are involuntary. Much of our behavior is based upon reflex responses to certain stimuli. For example, what do you do or what happens when someone shines a flashlight into the pupil of your eye? Your eye closes or the pupil constricts. Suppose a physician taps your knee with a little rubber hammer. If his aim is good, your leg flies up. What happens when you eat food? First, salivary changes occur, and then various gastric juices are produced to aid the digestive processes. All these are reflex actions. We normally have no control over a reflex action. The response is immediate and completely determined by the stimulus. In most cases, we can neither change the response nor prevent it. We do, however, have some measure of control over the second and third types of response. The second type is what we call a signal reaction. This reaction is similar to the reflex response in that it, too, is almost immediate. But let's see how it differs. A bus driver trying to make a turn in downtown Houston was stopped by a woman driver who was moving into a dangerous position. The driver whistled sharply at the woman, who was apparently unaware of the bus. The woman stopped and looked around while the driver maneuvered his bus into the opening. Asked by a passenger why he had whistled instead of honking, the driver replied, About half the women drivers in this town won't pay any attention to somebody honking, but there ain't a dame in Houston who won't stop and look when she hears a man whistle. The woman's response was a signal reaction, that is, a learned response. Just as the woman had conditioned herself not to hear honking, she had also developed the habit of looking around when she heard a man whistle. An enlisted serviceman provides us with the following illustration of a signal response. We enlisted men were at bat in a hotly contested baseball game with our officers, when a private hit what looked like a single to short right field. Instead of stopping at first, however, he foolishly started a wild dash for second. Realizing then that he couldn't make it, he scrambled back toward first. Now he was being chased in a rundown between the lieutenant playing first and the colonel playing second. It looked like a sure out, but just as the lieutenant flipped the ball back to the colonel, the private snapped to attention, saluting the colonel. Automatically, the colonel snapped the salute back and muffed the catch. This is another example of a conditioned or trained response in which a signal controls a reaction. Animals are trained to behave in response to signals. The Russian scientist Pavlov, in his classic experiments, 
conditioned dogs to salivate in response to the sound of a bell by ringing the bell every time he was about to give them food. Once conditioned, they would salivate when they heard the bell, even though there was no food. The same kind of unquestioning automatic reaction is seen in an animal's response to certain commands given by its master. An animal is not capable of controlling his behavior in the face of such stimuli. However, man is, and it is important for him to learn to do so. By responding with a signal reaction, he runs several risks. First, he is likely to misevaluate situations by jumping to conclusions or by assuming that he knows what someone else means. Secondly, he may never reach true or valid conclusions because he is bound by a non-scientific method which does not rely upon observation of the facts. And finally, there is the question of ethics. Signal reactions can lead to unjustified action against others. For these reasons, it is preferable for us to react in a third way. In a symbol reaction, man controls his own behavior. There is a happening, and a person feels its impact. But during the crucial seconds while he evaluates the situation, he pauses. There is a delay which cannot occur in the case of a reflex action and does not occur in a signal reaction. It is at this time that he observes and analyzes the situation. Then he reacts, not before. Misevaluation, how we become confused. When we fail to take time to observe and analyze, we often find ourselves reacting to an improper evaluation. Misevaluation sets off stupid, immature, and sometimes even destructive behavior. There are several forms which misevaluation can take. Number one, identification of words with things. One of the most common forms of misevaluation is the identification of words with things. Our present day culture presents an abundance of instances in which persons fail to distinguish between words and things. The party guest in Florida who became violently ill when she learned that she had consumed snake steak certainly demonstrated this form of misevaluation. If our behavior is to be mature and intelligent, we must make proper evaluations. We must delay our reactions until we have evaluated the situation as it is. Reactions to words without regard to the nonverbal things they represent can lead us to behavior which is inconsistent with the facts. Number two, misunderstanding. Even when words are not confused with things, they are likely to have different meanings for different persons. This leads to a second common form of misevaluation, misunderstanding. Misunderstanding results from a person's inability to convey his meaning in his efforts to communicate. Directions and instructions, for example, are frequently misunderstood. The foreman who told the machine operator to clean up around here failed to convey what he meant. The machine operator misevaluated the situation because he did not understand what the foreman meant. The foreman also misevaluated because he assumed that the machinist had comprehended his message. It is easy to demonstrate the ease with which a message may be misunderstood. Suppose someone tells you to write the word cat on the blackboard. How is this open to misunderstanding? First, it has not been specified when you are to do this. Right now, ten minutes from now, or tomorrow? And how many words are you to write? The word cat or simply cat? 
With what tools are you to write? Chalk? Lipstick? Invisible ink? Which blackboard are you to use? One in this room or one in another room? Because of a host of variables, meanings are always open to misunderstanding. And number three, acceptance of the part for the whole. Finally, acceptance of the part for the whole is a cause of misevaluation. An isolated fact or two does not enable us to fill in an accurate and complete picture of the situation. Take, for example, the report of an automobile race as released by the Russian press. According to the story which appeared in print, the Russian entry came in second and the American automobile came in next to last. How greatly this picture changes when we learn that there were only two cars competing in the race. In this case, the facts of the situation were deliberately incomplete. But even were this not so, people jump to false conclusions because they forget that they have only a selection of facts drawn from the infinite number which exists in the nonverbal world. Our mental pictures will differ greatly according to which facts we select and which ones we overlook. Am I responding to mere words, or is my behavior based on the facts as they are? Do I really know what the other person means? Do I really see the whole picture, or do I just think I do? These are three questions we must ask ourselves before we act if we wish to avoid misevaluation. What do you mean? Almost daily we see problems arise because of someone's inability to convey to someone else what he means. A person may know clearly what he means, and he may express it accurately, but this is no assurance that the listener will get his message or that he will understand it. Both speaker and listener unconsciously assume that they understand each other. This is not true. The explorations of general semanticists into the nature of meaning have revealed how some characteristics of our language cause behavior which leads to communication problems. Words don't mean people mean. We often talk about, quotes, the meanings of words. The very expression, the meaning of words, implies that meanings are in words. However, general semanticist Irving J. Lee has explained that this is a false assumption and a major cause of misunderstanding. According to Lee, it is a myth that words contain meaning, and this fallacy has become known as the container myth. In the same sense that a sugar bowl is empty until someone fills it with sugar, words are devoid of meaning until someone uses them and adds his meanings to them. Another way of looking at this point is to realize that language is arbitrary. A word is an arbitrary symbol which has been assigned to stand for some nonverbal object. This fact was obviously not understood by the lady who said to a famous astronomer, I feel such an admiration for you astronomers because of your wonderful discoveries about the universe. But the most wonderful of all, it seems to me, is your discovery of the names of the planets. How, for instance, did you ever manage to find out that the red planet named Mars really is Mars? The notion that the red planet, so conspicuous among the heavenly bodies, was first observed and then arbitrarily named Mars did not occur to this lady. How disillusioned she would be if she knew that the name Mars was attached to this stellar body in much the same way we assign a name to a street. S.I. Hayakawa has called this linguistic naivety. He says... Symbols and things symbolized are independent of each other. 
Nevertheless, we all have a way of feeling as if, and sometimes acting as if, there were necessary connections. For example, there is the vague sense we all have that foreign names are inherently absurd. Foreigners have funny names for things, and why can't they call things by their right names? This feeling exhibits itself most strongly in those English and American tourists who seem to believe that they can make the natives of any country understand English if they shout it loud enough. They feel that the symbol is inherently connected in some way with the thing symbolized. The arbitrariness of the language is painfully obvious in the example of the visiting American and his English friend who were driving through London when the latter mentioned that his windscreen needed cleaning. Windshield, the American corrected. Well, over here we call it windscreen. Then you're wrong, argued the American. After all, we Americans invented the automobile, and we call this a windshield. That's all very well, old boy, snapped the Englishman. But who invented the language? A word may have many meanings. Another characteristic of our language which causes problems is its ambiguity. Since there is no fixed one-to-one -one relationship between words and meanings, a word may have many uses. It may mean many different things. This little poem is composed of a number of words which are commonly used to represent a variety of objects. Where can a man buy a cap for his knee or a key for a lock of his hair? Can your eyes be called an academy because there are pupils there? In the crown of your head, what jewels are found? Who crosses the bridge of your nose? Could you use a shingling in the roof of your mouth, nails in the end of your toes? Could the crook in your elbow be sent to jail? How can you sharpen your shoulder blades? Could you sit in the shade of the palm of your hand or beat on the drum of your ear? Does the calf of your leg eat the corn on your toe? Then why grow corn on the ear? The 500 most used words in the English language have at least 14,000 different definitions. The fact that a number of meanings may be assigned to a given word explains why messages are subject to misinterpretation and why our communication is open to misunderstandings. With such odds against us, it becomes a real challenge to convey a specific meaning or intent successfully. And there is still one more factor we must consider in this whole discussion of meaning. Projection can cause misunderstanding. Since words do not contain meanings, it is necessary for us to project meanings into them when we use them. These projections are strongly influenced by each person's own experiences. Consequently, each person may have a unique personal meaning for any given word. Problems arise when we assume that a word has the same meaning for other people as it has for us. On the basis of their limited experience, children project meaning into the language they hear. The Lord's Prayer, for example, has had to withstand considerable abuse from children trying to learn it from mumbling congregations. One little boy was heard to pray, Herald be thy name. The request of another was, Give us this day our jelly bread. A New York child petitioned, Lead us not into Penn Station. Adults do the same thing sometimes on a more sophisticated level. Recently, I rode an airplane from San Francisco to Chicago I was deeply engrossed in a book on the game of bridge when the stewardess stopped and looked over my shoulder. That must be a fascinating love story you are reading, she commented. Startled, I looked at the chapter heading with fresh eyes. It was entitled, 
free responses after the original pass. These discrepancies in interpretation cause some of the greatest communication problems in industry. For example, we see the superintendent passing through the shop convoyed by the foreman. Being in a jovial mood, he makes a conversational comment that the girls seem happy this morning, the way they are talking and laughing. The foreman thinks, is he hinting that I shouldn't allow them to talk? Does he think I don't keep proper discipline? Those girls ought to have sense enough to stop talking and act busy when he's around. Maybe I'd better move Mary off by herself because she always gets the others started talking. The boss leaves, quite unaware, that his comments have been interpreted as criticism. As soon as he is gone, the foreman balls out the girls for talking and not paying attention to their work. He moves the Marys around, and it is weeks or even months before the final ripples of disturbance have died down. In avoiding the misunderstandings which arise from projection, we should keep in mind these suggestions. Number one, remember that meanings are in people, not in words. Number two, be conscious that a word may have more than one meaning. Beware of the ambiguity of language. Number three, be conscious that we learn meanings from past experiences. Number four, be conscious of projecting our own meanings into what others are saying. And number five, if you are the speaker, ask the listener if he understands you. If you are the listener, ask the speaker, what do you mean? Understanding Through an Open Mind In our daily use of language, our attitudes and our ways of thinking can at any time lead us to communication failure. They affect our motivation to communicate, our listening effectiveness, and ultimately our behavior. We should be familiar enough with the problems they can cause so that we can recognize and cope with these when they appear. Avoid the allness attitude. One of the greatest blocks to communication is the allness attitude. It manifests itself in people who fail to listen because they're already thinking to themselves, I know all about that. Because they assume that they know all there is to know about something, these people develop a number of poor thinking, listening, and speaking habits. Please turn the cassette over for the start of Side B at this point. People afflicted with an allness attitude, and most of us are, fail to realize that there are many factors which limit our acquaintance with things. Individually, we are bound by the span of our intellectual abilities and our senses. We are bound by the current body of existing knowledge, the confines of time and space, 
culture, language, and education. Finally, we are limited by our own interests, which determine the way we see the world and the facts we select from the total nonverbal environment. The allness attitude, or orientation, leads a person to overlook these limitations. It causes him to act as though he knows all about something and to assume more knowledge than he really has. The following story illustrates the allness attitude. A young man said in a faint voice, You don't want to buy any life insurance, do you? I certainly do not, the sales manager replied. I thought you didn't, the embarrassed solicitor said, and he headed for the door. Then the sales manager called him back and addressed him sternly. My job is to hire and train salesmen, and you're about the worst salesman I've ever seen. You'll never sell anything by asking people if they don't want to buy. But because you're apparently just starting out, I'm going to take out $10,000 worth of insurance with you right now. Get an application blank. Fumblingly, the salesman did so, and the deal was closed. Then the sales manager said, Another word of advice, young man. Learn a few standard organized sales talks. Oh, I've already done that, the salesman replied. I've got a standard talk for every type of prospect. This is my organized approach to sales managers. This sales manager thought he knew it all. But this did not prevent him from making a colossal fool of himself. Non-allness on his part might have prevented this. Non-allness is simply the realization of the limitations of our knowledge. If we realize that we do not know it all, we are much less likely to be misled into faulty thinking and speaking practices. Let's look at some of these practices which accompany the Allness attitude. Beware of either-or orientation. The allness orientation tends to distort a person's sense of values as well as his way of thinking. Many problems are created when we assume that things are either one extreme or the other, either black or white. Actually, there are four different approaches we can use in our evaluations. First and worst is the one-valued orientation. This leads to the kind of overgeneralized evaluations which we know as stereotypes. The one-valued approach admits to the possibility of only one truth. All lawyers are shysters. All cops are crooked. All mothers-in-law are difficult. All labor leaders are racketeers. The people who make such statements are using allness language. Words like all, always, never tend to push our thinking into set, rigid patterns. It is difficult to get agreement when someone not only refuses to see the other sides of the picture, but actually denies the existence of any other side. This kind of thinking is dangerous because we live in a world where things change constantly. When we fail to recognize the fact of change, we begin to misevaluate. For this reason, the one-valued approach can only lead us into trouble. Next, there are two kinds of two-valued approaches. There are the contradictory two and the contrary two. The contradictory to involves an assertion and a denial. In other words, either yes or no, positive or negative. The contradictory two-valued approach is justified when it applies to situations in which there really is no middle ground. Here, the either-or way of thinking and speaking is appropriate. Either you came to work today or you did not. Both extremes cannot possibly be true. In the case of the contrary to, statements are made about things which exist at the opposite ends of a scale. This scale has continuous variations between the two extremes. Therefore, the use of either-or language and thinking forces us into a false denial of the existence of the middle ground 
or continuous variations which extend from one extreme to the other. Finally, there is the multi-valued approach. Except for the situation of the contradictory two, this is the most desirable approach to logical thought and action. The multi-valued approach searches out differences, gradations, and alternatives. It enables us to evaluate every situation anew and to refuse to let previous judgments close our minds to the uniqueness of each particular case. This approach is the basis of the scientific method. Some examples of two-valued orientation show us just how dangerous this kind of thinking and speaking can be. These examples should make the advantages of the multi-valued approach quite evident. Many of the terms we use in the English language are what we call polar terms. Something is either hot or cold, right or wrong, good or bad, smart or dumb. We are either Democrats or Republicans, labor or management, guilty or innocent. The use of such terms implies that only extremes exist. Yet water may be lukewarm, tepid, room heat, or many other degrees of temperature between the polar extremes of hot and cold. But still we use the terms hot and cold, often implying that there is nothing between these two. By doing this, we often preclude the possibility of reaching agreement with others and may actually increase the opportunities for disagreement to occur. Even our non-polar terms tend not to be truly neutral. Many of them seem to lean toward one extreme or the other. What term would you use to describe the exact middle point of temperature between hot and cold? Tepid is about as close as we can get, and it implies a slight tendency toward hot. With the exception of scientific terms such as average or median, our language does not supply us with many terms to express a middle point. A New York Times linotype operator inadvertently created such a word one day, the story which appeared in the paper concerned a certain public official who was considered to be, or so said the story, a pood security risk. The word pood dangles in midair between good and poor. Not too good, not too poor. Many things fall into this category. Shows, sports, cooking, health, parties, and so many others may be Pood. Such a word offers tremendous possibilities. To return to the dangers of using the two-valued approach, we can conclude that this approach, number one, pushes us further away from others than we are or ought to be in our disagreements with them. Number two, makes it difficult to take a moderate stand on an issue. Number three, forces us to polar extremes. Number four, makes it difficult for us to turn to a third alternative or possibility. And number five, closes us off from further means of problem solving. Keep your feet on the ground. Realizing that within the framework of our own perspectives, we see only some of the nonverbal facts which exist, we are now ready to understand the concept of abstraction. We shall see how high-order abstraction can cause us to misevaluate. Words in our language may be used to represent facts at different levels, some more specific, some more general. As the terminology employed becomes less specific, we may think of it as climbing higher in its level of abstraction. The word chair, for example, is fairly specific. The word furniture is more abstract. It refers to many things besides chairs. 
and the term manufactured item is still more abstract. Low-order abstractions are words that are specific and concrete. They have direct reference to an individual thing in the real world at a given time. High-order abstractions are words that are ambiguous or vague. They may have many meanings and interpretations, the number increasing as the level of abstraction becomes higher. Contrary to popular belief, High-order abstractions are not meaningless. Rather, they are too meaningful because they can mean all things to all men. As the order of abstraction becomes higher, the possibility of projection and misunderstanding increases. Federalese, the terminology in which many bureaucratic directives are written, provides us with some outstanding illustrations of high-order abstraction leading to chaos. It bowed low to the merits of plain English, however, when a New York City plumber wrote to the Bureau of Standards that he found hydrochloric acid good for cleaning out clogged drain pipes. He received the following response from the Bureau. The efficacy of hydrochloric acid is indisputable, but the corrosive residue is incompatible with metallic permanence. The plumber wrote back that he was glad that the Bureau agreed with him. To this the Bureau wrote another reply, We cannot assume responsibility for the production of toxic and noxious residue with hydrochloric acid and suggest that you use an alternative procedure. By return mail, the plumber again expressed his pleasure that the government thought his idea was a good one. In desperation, the Bureau broke down and wrote to the plumber in plain English. Their final message was, Don't use hydrochloric acid. It eats hell out of the pipes. It doesn't take much to imagine the catastrophes that could arise from continued use of such high-order abstractions. Where do we find these abstractions? Certainly they appear often in speeches, orders, directives, and other forms of communication used in industry and the government. Here, for example, is the speech for all occasions, which could be given anywhere, anytime, to anyone. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great and undeserved privilege to address such an audience as I see before me. At no previous time in the history of civilization have greater problems confronted and challenged the ingenuity of man's intellect than now. Let us look around us. What do we see on the horizon? What forces are at work? Whither are we drifting? Under what mist of clouds does the future stand obscure? My friends, casting aside the raiment of all human speech, the crucial test for the solution of all these intricate problems to which I have just alluded is the sheer and forceful application of those immutable laws which down the corridor of time have always guided the hand of man, groping as it were, for some faint beacon light. Without these great vital principles, we are but puppets responding to human fancy, failing entirely to grasp the hidden meaning of it all. We must address ourselves to these questions which press for answer and solution. The issue cannot be avoided. There they stand. It is upon you and you and, yes, even upon me, that the yoke of responsibility falls. What then is our duty? Shall we continue to drift? No, with all the emphasis of my being, I hurl back the message, no. Drifting must stop. We must press onward and upward toward the ultimate good to which all must aspire. But I cannot conclude my remarks, dear friends, without touching briefly upon a subject which I know is steeped in your buried conscience. I refer to that spirit which gleams from the eyes of a newborn babe, that animates the tawdry masses, that sways all the hosts of humanity, past and present. 
Without this energizing principle, all commerce and industry are hushed and will perish from this earth as surely as the crimson sun follows the golden sunshine. Mark you, I do not seek to unduly alarm or distress the mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters gathered before me in this vast assembly, but I would indeed be recreant to the high resolve which I made as a youth if I did not at this time and at this place, and with a full realizing sense of responsibility which I assume, publicly declare and affirm my dedication and my concentration to the eternal principles and receipts of simple, ordinary, commonplace justice. For what in the last analysis is justice? Whence does it come? Where does it go? Is it ponderable? It is not. Justice is none of these things. And yet, on the other hand, it is all of these things combined. While I cannot tell you what justice is, this much I can tell you, that without the encircling arms of justice, without her shield, without her guardianship, this ship of state will sail through uncharted seas, narrowly avoiding rocks and shallows, headed inevitably to the harbor of calamity. Justice, justice, justice. To thee we pay homage. To thee we dedicate our laurels of hope. Before thee we kneel in adoration, mindful of thy great power, mute before thy inscrutable destiny. Audiences usually burst into gales of applause when this speech is delivered, but what specifically does it mean? Nothing. It is so full of high-order abstractions that we can project any meaning we wish into it. The speaker refers repeatedly to justice. But what is justice? He himself says he cannot tell you what it is. The margin for misunderstanding of the speech is tremendous because its abstract, vague terms present little that helps to pinpoint its meaning. This is why general semanticists urge people to keep their feet on the ground verbally. This means giving details, quoting facts and figures, mentioning dates and places, focusing on the visible, the audible, and the measurable, and referring to direct experiences rather than to hazy thoughts, vague opinions, and general ideas. Use indexing and dating. To be reasonable and intelligent, our thinking and talking must fit the facts in the world of reality. The world of reality is a vast, complex structure, constantly in a state of change. But our language is of a different nature. It implies that the world is static and unchanging. It does not reflect the changes which take place in the world around us. This discrepancy between the nature of the real world and the nature of our language can lead us to misevaluation if we tend to accept words as being truthful representations of the facts. Two vitally important characteristics of the real world are non-identity, or differences, and process, or change. Consider the first of these characteristics. As far as we know, there are no two things in the world of reality that are identical. Identical twins are not identical in all respects. Two pieces of sand or two snowflakes are not identical. We can think about identity, but we cannot find it. In other words, differences are characteristic of the structure of reality, while similarities are created by the human intellect. And it is similarities rather than differences that tend to get stressed in our language. We use the single label Democrat, for example, to refer to millions of people, each of whom cast a Democratic vote in the election. 
Yet each of these is a uniquely different person who has his own thoughts about labor, civil rights, and local political issues. How can we overcome this tendency of our language to imply similarity? How can we gear our communication and behavior to the differences which observation reveals? In other words, how can we make our language fit the structure of reality? We can do this by applying an indexing principle to our language. That is, we can point up differences by adding a subscript or index number to the specific objects covered by a generic term. For instance, Worker 1 is not Worker 2. Boss 1 is not Boss 2. And Situation 1 is not Situation 2. By doing this, we change the structure of our language to fit the world of reality. Look at the misevaluation that occurs when we fail to do this. Samuel Johnson said, I am willing to love all mankind except an American. A man in Milwaukee who, after walking up to a policeman and socking him on the jaw, said, I don't like policemen. I had all this inside of me. Now I guess it's released. There's the case of the small boy in New Britain, Connecticut, who marched up to a department store Santa Claus, punched him in the nose, and yelled, That's for not bringing me a bicycle last year. Finally, there's the young lady who suddenly rushed up to a stranger and started beating him with her umbrella, yelling, How dare you remind me of someone I hate? The rewards of seeing differences are great. In any field, science, business, industry, government, the demand is for individuals who can see differences. A man's earning power is often commensurate with his capacity to produce new ideas, to take chances. In other words, to think and act differently. The second characteristic of the real world the fact that it is in a state of change also requires a form of indexing for reorganizing time differences. Everything in the world is constantly changing. Some of these changes occur at the submicroscopic level and are not visible to the naked eye. Thus, the chair you are sitting on is changing. The desk you work at is changing. And you, too, are changing. Take a look at a picture of yourself taken 20 years ago. Science 1846 is not science 1962, which is not science today. Military defense 1945 is not military defense 1962, which is not military defense today. By dating things, we indicate that we are aware of the differences between them at given times in history. When we date our evaluations in this way, we will keep our thinking in line with the changing facts of reality. The following episode shows how necessary it is for us to re-evaluate situations continually. During a heavy flood, a little girl was perched on top of a house with a small boy. As they watched articles float along, they noticed a derby hat on the water. Presently, the hat turned and came back, then turned again and went downstream. After it went away, it turned and came back again. The little girl said, Do you see that derby? First it goes downstream, then it turns and comes back. The boy replied, Oh, that's father. He said, Come hell or high water, I'm going to cut the grass today. How often do we run our businesses or our own lives in this same manner? By refusing to change our ways of thinking to fit the changing facts. One of America's most important philosophers, Charles Sanders Peirce, said, The scientific spirit requires a man to be at all times ready to dump his whole cartload of beliefs the moment experience is against him. 
Summary The preceding discussion has tried to provide an understanding of the relationship between language and behavior. The framework for this discussion has been the principles advanced by the general semanticists. Let's briefly review some of the points we've covered and see how awareness of them can help us to improve our day-to-day -day communication. Behavior should fit the world of reality. First, we saw that there are really two distinct worlds in which we live, the verbal world of words and the nonverbal world of things. The words are merely symbols which represent or stand for the nonverbal realities. Human behavior may be broken down into four phases. Something happens. A nervous impact creates awareness of the happening. Next, the person sizes up the situation with an evaluation. And then, on the basis of his evaluation, he responds. We saw that proper evaluations are more likely to be made when we exhibit a symbol reaction. When we pause, observe, and evaluate the situation, not merely in terms of the verbal representations which symbolize it, but as it really exists. Such evaluations lead us to behave in accordance with the facts of the real or nonverbal world. Misevaluation usually occurs in one of three forms. The first is identification of words with things. Such identification causes us to react to words as if they were things. Soon our behavior no longer fits the facts as they are. Second, there is the problem of projection, where we unconsciously assume that we know what the other person meant because we know what it means to us. This is a frequent source of misunderstanding. Finally, there is acceptance of the part for the whole, a practice akin to allness. We must never behave as if we know all there is to know, because this type of behavior inhibits us from learning additional and perhaps crucial facts. Meaning itself can mislead us. There are characteristics inherent in language which we should be aware of if we are to avoid misevaluating the world around us. One of the most significant of these characteristics lies in the very nature of words. It is easier to respond only to nonverbal stimuli when we are aware of the following qualities of words. Number one, words do not mean. The myth that words contain meaning is based upon incorrect assumptions. Number two, words are arbitrary. Because there is no one-to-one -one relationship between words and things, words are assigned to certain things by agreement or social convention. Number three, words have many uses. Just as one specific object may be referred to by a number of different words, so too a specific word may be used to refer to a number of different objects. This multi-usage of words accounts for many misunderstandings. And number four, meanings are in people. Words become meaningful only when we, on the basis of our past experiences, project our own meanings into them. Finally, we saw how certain practices in our communication cause us to develop improper thinking and speaking habits. We looked at three practices which generally go hand in hand with the allness attitude, the attitude that we know all there is to know about something. Number one. Either-or orientation widens the gaps between people. The indiscriminating use of the either-it's-this-way-or-it's-that-way approach forces people to take extreme positions in disagreements 
which might be resolved if handled in some other way. Number 2. Use of high-order abstractions pushes us farther from instead of closer to the nonverbal facts to which we should be responding. Too much abstraction makes our communication vague, ambiguous, and meaningless. Number three, failure to recognize the process of change causes us to overgeneralize and stereotype. These common misevaluations can be avoided when we seek differences and uniqueness instead of similarities in any situation. Indexing and dating help us to do this. Non-allness is the realization of the limitations of our own knowledge. If each of us can develop an open mind, ready to admit new facts, and to change our convictions on the basis of new evidence, we are on the way to achieving a non-allness attitude. This attitude, coupled with an awareness of the principles of general semantics, should help us to better understand our own behavior as expressed in our daily communications.